I want to bring on Christian Whiten. He was the senior advisor in the Trump administration and also in the George W. Bush administration. He joins us via Skype now. Christian, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, these sanctions seem, I mean, they seem very limited. And I noticed when I, I was looking over what the White House sent out, it's odd that that one of the first moves that they're making is to actually look at that separatist area of Ukraine. I would just think that there would be heavier sanctions on on Russia and, and a, a more of a, a, a restriction of Russia's ability to move and fund what it is that they're doing, especially as it relates to energy. I just wanted to get kind of your initial thoughts on this. Right, Dan. I, well, this is the problem with Biden talking tough. You know, he goes around sounding like John Wayne and acting like Shirley Temple. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm suggesting that we, you know, go and invade right. or go to war with Russia over this. We don't have a whole lot of interest. But Putin was kind of right when he said they're going to put sanctions on us. And he said this a while ago, that they're going to put sanctions on us and it's not going to harm us. Uh, if you look at, at Russia, I, <laughs> I hate to sound like a fanboy, but if you look at their balance sheet, they have a balanced budget. They have debt to GDP uh, that's far less than the United United States. Yeah, they have some maturing bonds and we might be able to tamper with their ability to issue new ones, but they could just pay off maturing bonds with cash on hand. They're doing pretty well with oil touching close to a hundred bucks a barrel because of course they're a big exporter. Um, thanks so, to Biden. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and, and thanks. Yes. Biden and Germany uh, and this whole green, uh, green transition that may not happen as fast as the neoliberals mm. think it will has made us, you know, um, increasingly dependent on countries like this. Yeah. And to that point, you just mentioned it with Germany as well. Well, we're talking to Christian Whiten. Uh, Germany said, oh, well, we're, you know what? We're not going to we're not going to do this deal with Nord Stream 2 right now because Russia invaded. But it's pretty much all said and done. I mean, the construction was almost completed when Trump got into the White House. This whole process started in 2011. He stopped it. He was sanctioning, you know, the I think it's Gazprom, the, the guy, the company run by the, the former Stasi guy, uh, who's Putin's BFF, was sanctioning these oligarchs, sanctioning these companies, had levied pretty strict sanctions on, on Russia overall that Biden immediately removed. And then when Ted Cruz had a bill trying to reimpose these sanctions, Democrats used that old Jim Crow relic of filibuster to try <laughs> to right. stop it's it. Back in, yeah. yeah, back in January, <laughs> the big racist. So... I, I, why, why now? I mean, it just seems like that, that seems like a weak move from Germany. That's like Germany ralphing it from the Simpsons. I helped, but they didn't do anything. I, I mean, they waited too long. Christian, your thoughts. I love the Ralph analogy. Yeah. Uh, well, also they didn't just wait too long. They're not serious about it. No one, no one in the energy business. I was talking to an oil trader or at least an oil analyst earlier today. And Germany is absolutely going to operate this pipeline. It's Nord Stream 2. It's the second one. There's already one that operates. Mm -hmm. They spent billions of dollars on it. But it's not just the, it's the Germans, not the German government. It's actually a consortium that includes a Dutch company and an Austrian company. So a lot of money on the line. They've spent the billions. It's sitting there. Absolutely, Germany is going to operate this as soon as this dies down a little bit. Uh, and they're going to become more dependent on Russian gas because, uh, and you know, they've just taken a shift to the left if that's possible. It's not like there are any, um, any mega uh, conservatives running around Germany. It's not in any positions of power. But uh, they're going to shut down their remaining nuclear power plants, not because they're dangerous, not because they're too old, just because that goes against the theology of the green left. So uh, more of this to come. Germany is absolutely going to wimp out. Absolutely. It's just it's a wild situation talking with Christian Whiten, who worked in the Trump administration uh, and in the State Department. And and Christian, these this this move yesterday from uh, Putin, which I look, I'll admit I, I'm being very grown up here. I call him pillow face McStalin. Uh, this move from <laughs> Vladimir Putin to recognize this separatist region, and I know there are two separatist groups, the Donbas region, as being independent. And th they've already had, I mean, correct me if, on this if I'm wrong, they've already, Russia's already had soldiers there, whether they're official, like they're in their, I mean, they've, they've literally actually, I mean, they've, they've done, they've carried out operations where they've dressed in their opposition's uniforms before. I mean, they, these are, they've been there in this region since 2014 for all the people who go back to that Budapest agreement and say, look, the United States promised that we would help, but there were assurances, but there wasn't a guarantee, correct? That's right. No, is is uh, no, there's not. You're right on all counts. This was an invasion, but it took place in 2014 with so-called little green men. So maybe the Russians yeah. involved took the the flags off their uniforms, and now they can put them back on. Uh, but this is is you know as. As Biden himself said, Putin has to make a move. The United States Biden administration has sort of put Putin in this corner. 
Um, and, uh, you know, where he had to do something because we kept telling him he couldn't. He had a huge incentive to illustrate that NATO is a paper tiger. And despite what, you know, Admiral Kirby says, we're going to go and shore up, uh, you know, NATO. We're going to send 3,000 troops to Poland as if 3,000 troops against a million man army in Russia that can plus up to two or more million. Incidentally, I don't think Putin, Russia is going to invade Poland or anything else for that matter. But uh, just a lot of, of loose talk around and, and not a realization that this is Putin short of going through the steps that he had planned in advance to put himself on the stage to make sure that Ukraine would never be a part of NATO and to call out the West, to call out the fist-bumping fools of the G7 uh, for what they are. A lot of talk. It's the opposite of Teddy Roosevelt. who said, speak softly and carry a big stick. You were there, Christian, in the Trump administration when he went and faced off against Angela Merkel, that infamous picture where Trump was sitting at the desk and Merkel looked very angry and Trump had his arms crossed. And he looked very, he looked smug and like he was he was negotiating from a position of authority. And this was about the time that he was pressing these NATO members, at least meet just the bare minimum of, you know, contributing, you know, 2% of your GDP towards your own self-defense. That looks very prophetic now. Uh, and I'm and I'm I, and your your comment about calling out the West that really does strike me as because it's always it always falls up on the West but yet it seems like it was the United States that's the only entity that's truly meeting that NATO responsibility. Uh, what is your take? Yeah, so Biden says NATO is unified. It's like okay, yeah. So you know what? Spain, Italy, Romania. It's like. These countries, um, they can be with us because they have to do absolutely nothing here. Once again, this is proven that the only real force in NATO is the United States with some maybe more than token, but not particularly significant augmentation from uh, Britain and France. Now, Turkey has a real army, but they're not engaged in this, nor are they looking for a voluntary war with Russia since they have their own, you know, um, confrontation, if you will, or, right. or proximity with Russia. So, uh, yeah, it's it's Europe has chosen decadent decline the idea that they're going to have World War III to fight a bunch of, uh, to fight in Ukraine. And if you look at the verbiage, it's not, of course, just Germany and others saying, well, actually, we don't think there's going to be a huge regional invasion. Um, look at what the Ukrainians are saying. They're, they're pretty calm and confident. It was the American diplomats who just took off in the middle of the night for Poland. Yeah, talking with Christian Whiten. So Putin's goal really is ultimately to restore the glory of the Soviet Union. I mean, old, I mean, he's talked about this before. He said, what, that the fall of the Soviet Union was <clears throat> the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Do his ambitions exceed beyond that? Because a lot of people love to make World War II comparisons. And my stopping point has always been, well, Hitler wanted to control the world. I mean, let's remove everything else, you know, and just look at it very clinically. He wanted to control the world. Does Putin have those same amb amb ambitions beyond restoring the Soviet Union? I don't think seriously, and I'm not sure he even intends to restore the Soviet Union in a geographical sense. I mean, he just sent security forces into Kazakhstan at their request by the tyrant there to suppress yeah. an uprising. But then he brought them out when the, when the uprising was crushed, which is not really the action you would take if you were going to, you know, expand outward inexorably. You would just keep them there and be like, oh, that's ours now. <laughs> um, you know, in the same way a British imperial officer in 1960 or 65 might think the collapse of the Second British Empire was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of his lifetime, okay, but that doesn't mean he was planning to reinvade India and Egypt and Singapore mm. and Yemen. Um, I think Putin wants to dominate his near abroad politically and um, taking the steps to do that to, you know, express to the Ukrainians that they cannot be a part of NATO, that that would lead to war. Yeah. Uh, I think he's given power to people in Ukraine. And when, this country is much more divided than we make it out to be in the West. Uh, and when they go into their next set of elections, uh, the people who are saying, you know, maybe and this happened in Georgia, maybe we don't need a president who sort of is going to be constantly agitating our big neighbor to the east. Very interesting. That's a that's an interesting thought. It is. I mean, there is there's been some argument talking about, you know, there's people in this part of Ukraine that want independence, whether or not there's that's a majority or whether I, or how much of that has been Russian led. I think that's you know, that's a, a big discussion. Is this also there was a piece in The Wall Street Journal that was that was mentioning, uh, for the lack of a better way to put it, a, uh, a kind of a buffer zone is do you, I mean, is that just sort of he just wants like this buffer zone between more NATO aligned countries and then Russia? I think there is something to that. He does not like the idea. You know, we can say to ourselves that NATO is a defensive alliance, and of course, we're never going to start a war with Russia. But then 
if you think of the way Russia looks at the world, its history of facing these continental threats, the fact that NATO either directly or indirectly was involved in Afghanistan, uh, directly, indirectly NATO members, um, certainly the war in Libya, um, Syria, uh, other expeditionary um, things. And mm. it's one thing for the Baltics to be in. He's not happy about that, but those are you know sort of off by themselves geographically. <laughs> we can't defend them. Um, Ukraine really does create that land bridge through Germany and Poland. Um, so I think he would like that. Incidentally, that's been a proposal a couple people have thrown around um, that, that Ukraine should be like Austria was in the Cold War. We negotiated with Stalin the neutrality of Austria. He actually took Soviet troops out. Um, that would be something that seemingly would serve all of our interests. And of course, that's nowhere in the realm of possibilities for the Washington National Security Establishment. Mm, yeah, the last question for you, talking with Christian Witten. Whiten. I want to say Witten so bad because I know someone that has your exact last name and they say it differently. Christian, he was with the Trump administration uh, and I've really enjoyed talking with you. Last question on this. This is I, I not to sound like a conspiracy theorist or put a tinfoil hat on, but there's a lot of discussion about China's relationship with Russia. I realize that China and, and Russia, they have some of the same aims, but not necessarily the same motivations. Uh, they seem similar in terms of ideology, but I mean, only recently became friends again for, you know, in a, a layman's way to put it. Uh, but there is some talk that this would embolden China further with Taiwan if they see a very weak administration and our lack of even our non-willingness to even implement tough sanctions, even back, even back in 2014 or even, you know, it, yeah. in the past year. Is this going to encourage China to become more aggressive with Taiwan? Two part or first part. Second part. Is there any potential of a Russian-Chinese kind of super commie alliance that maybe we should be a little bit concerned about? Right. The first question, I, I, there is, I, certainly Xi Jinping is aware of what's going on and sees, I think, chaos um, and deception in, uh, in the part of Biden in the West and that, that, again, NATO, the G7, paper tiger, by and large, you know, we're too busy debating how many genders there are to, <laughs> you know, realize that there's a serious threat in the world. So I think if he decides to go into Taiwan, it'll be a somewhat of an independent choice. And he might actually like for us to get bogged down in Europe. He, he would like for us to waste more money. You know, we have this military focused on counterinsurgency that that capability doesn't do us any good against the Chinese. And similarly, if we were to build up or even just maintain our 25,000 plus troops in Europe. Again, that's irrelevant to China. He it would be better to cut that and actually get more submarines and aircraft and nuclear systems in the Pacific. Um, now as for this, the sort of the, the alliance, it's a real risk, this sort of Russia, China, condominium and Eurasia. There's still enough that separates these countries. And Russia knows that China, you got a billion plus people who covet their natural resources in the thinly populated eastern part of Russia. That's something we should be accentuating. We shouldn't be pushing Russia into Beijing's arms, which we're, we're kind of doing, which is unfortunate. So it's concerning. It's not quite a full-blown military alliance just yet. That's a great point just then about about Russia's eastern territory and just the, the lack of an ability to really enforce it if China decided, yeah, you know, we kind of like what you got over there. That's an excellent point. I've never heard anybody make that. So Christian White, and we'd love to talk with you again. Great conversation. Thank you so much for your insight. And you can find his book, Smart Power Between Diplomacy and War, online as well. Christian, thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.